You know, in my early teens, my, my grandmother, she worked at a small mom and pop store in, in Tallahassee, Florida, that was called Everything Party. I've alluded to this before. And some of my favorite things that this mom and pop store sold were the far side comic books and, and, and calendars. Any, any of y'all remember those? And because she knew that I enjoyed them so much, I, I've told you this story, just about every year she worked at the store, she would always bring me the latest calendar or, or either book for my birthday or for Christmas. Y'all know how grandmothers are. And I want to share some of my favorite Farside comic strips with you this morning to lead into the message today. The word that the Lord has already spoken this morning to us in a time of worship. Regardless of what's going on around us, trust in Him. Don't be distracted by the hardships. Don't be distracted by the burdens. Don't be distracted by the circumstances. Trust in Him. The first one, as you already see, I already see smiles on your face this morning. These are some of my favorite. Man wanted with 40 years experience, but must be 25. That makes sense, doesn't it? The next one really falls in line with the same deal, and these guys are really in trouble when the mirage dries up. And then the final one, maybe my favorite of all three, they all deal with the same thing. But these guys evidently through their ratty clothes and all have been crawling in this desert for, for quite a while. And what do they face? A camel crawling as well. And as the man says, well, this isn't a cheerful sign. And these comic strips are, are, are definitely funny but they portray something that is very real in our lives. What they portray is scenes of hope slipping away. Have you been there? Where hope just seems like it's slipping away. Even as the Lord spoke already this morning in our worship time, don't focus on those things. Focus on me. Focus on me. Is that denying the things? No. No, it's we're bringing the things to Him and saying, my hope is not in these things that would cause me to lose grip on hope. God, You are my hope. It has been said that a state of hopelessness is closely akin to a state of death because a state of hopelessness we may be alive physically, but we're not really living. Hope is essential to the human soul as water or food is to our physical bodies. In fact, one thing that will make hell so unbearable is the absolute absence of hope and any possibility of it because hell will be void of the presence of God. And Paul described our state of hopelessness for us. Romans 7, 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? What is he talking about, this body of death? He's talking about a life apart from Christ as Lord and Savior. He's talking from a life that is lived in sin and in separation of God's presence. Wretched man, Paul says, that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death because sin leads to death? But he doesn't leave us in a state of hopelessness, does he? No, because verse 25 states, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the one who redeems us, sets us free, and brings hope, living hope, into our lives. And after verse 25, declaring that it is Christ who makes us alive, Paul continues in Romans 8 to describe for us the new life that is made possible 
when we completely give ourselves to Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, what we call being born again. And this new life is made possible by the presence and the power of Holy Spirit. What we call life in the Spirit. It's not something that we're in a transcendent state that we don't have our mental capacity or even our emotional capacities or in charge of our physical being. No, life in the Spirit means God's in the driver's seat. Not us, God is. And Paul describes what life in the Spirit is in Romans 8 and verse 11 by saying, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now the phrase in the Spirit just simply means it is a life that is made possible only Because the Spirit of God has come to live in us. That we have placed our faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. And now that puts God in the driver's seat of our life. We are the co-pilots. We are no longer the pilots. We are the co-pilots. He's the one that leads and directs. And directs us in this life. It's what it means to be in the Spirit. And Paul says the Spirit of God dwells. He dwells. He's not an occasional visitor who is, just comes every now and then, but he is the one who has taken up residence in our lives. He resides in us. And we now have a brand new way of living that has been made possible by faith through the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit. And this new life in the Spirit has everything to do with the word hope. Everything to do with the word hope. If Christ is your Lord and Savior, if Christ is in the driver's seat of your life and you pronounce faith daily in Him, that Lord, you're leading me, I'm walking in your way, our life has everything to do with that word hope because we are walking by the means of Holy Spirit. And that word hope carries the meaning of having eager expectation for something that is assured. Assured. Eager expectation of what I know is real and will be. And Paul in Romans 8 and verse 18. Notice how he makes a proper context And what I mean, the proper context between suffering and hope. And the word that the Lord has spoken this morning, if you're new to Pentecost, 1 Corinthians 12, 14, you can read of how the Lord has spoken to us this morning as His children to encourage. And that the word was spoken is directly in line with His word. But there is a connection between suffering and hope. Even in the word this morning that the Lord gave, did He not speak that we will have times of struggle? But where do we put our confidence? In Him. And Paul in verse 18 of Romans 8 He alludes to our suffering. If you've got your Bibles open, a digital version, printed version, you can see it there. But in verse 18, he alludes to our suffering in this life and how we share as God's children. We share in painful anticipation. In fact, Paul says it this way, we groan. Have you ever groaned? I know that's a foolish question, isn't it? depending on how old we are, and I'm finding that reality. My dad, my mom, my grandparents, they warned me, and I'm beginning to groan a little bit. And you that identify, you're laughing because you identify. (laughs) And some of you may be saying, well, just hold on. 
<laughs> but Paul says we groan, right? We groan as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. Paul states this context of suffering and anticipation requires hope. Let me say that again. Paul says that the context of suffering and anticipation requires hope. Where does he say that? Romans 8, 23. Having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, God's children, those who have put faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, confess their sins. God is now in the driver's seat of our life. Having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope... Come on, say that. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we do not see through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So notice Paul uses an Old Testament understanding to explain hope. That understanding of first fruits. In the Old Testament, first fruits consisted of the initial portion of the harvest that was given in sacrifice to God. You can find it, Exodus 23, Leviticus 23. You find the scripture references to the first fruits. Israel brought an offering, an act of worship, a portion of the fruits that ripened at the beginning of harvest to the Lord. And in doing so, what they were doing was acknowledging that the produce of the field that they harvested was the provision of God and was his. It's his. It's all yours, Lord. You've given the provision and it's yours. And not only that, but the offering of the first fruits was looked on as a pledge of what was still to come. First fruits were a pledge of the not yet that would come in the future. And Paul used the term first fruits in reference to the gift of Holy Spirit as an eschatological pledge from God to us as his children for what is to come. He said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 5. For we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made by hands, Eternal in the heavens, for indeed in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, since in fact after putting it on, we will not be found naked. For indeed, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal, and I love this part, will be swallowed up in life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is who? God. Who gave us who? Holy Spirit as a pledge. In other words, Paul is saying this, and we're going to bring it all together. Holy Spirit is God's spiritual down payment to his children on the inheritance that will be ours because we are a part of his family. Anytime we go to a bank, normally, you have to put a security down, yes? Something of that nature, a down payment to, of a guarantee, hey, I'm going to finish paying this off. But God is faithful, isn't he? And Holy Spirit is our spiritual down payment from God of the assurity of what is to come, that God will finish the work he has begun in us by faith. Do we groan in the interim? Can we not all say this morning, amen? We groan. We groan and we are burdened. Doesn't 
2 Corinthians 5, verses 2 and 4, that we've just read allude to that. We groan, we are burdened, but in our groanings, we have Holy Spirit guaranteeing what is to come and enabling us to live the initial fruits now, but we'll fully receive it when Christ returns. I like how Paul continues to put it in Romans 8. Look at verse 26. Now, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you been there in your burden? Have you been there in your trials that you cannot get words out as you are focusing your hope upon God? That you cannot even speak verbally of just the press of the groaning because of the things that you are facing. But what Paul is saying here is that even in that intense that we can't even verbalize it, Holy Spirit is taking even our groans and He is interceding for us according to God's will to our Heavenly Father. Well, even when we can't get the words out, our prayers are lifted to God. And He searches the heart, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God, verse 27 says. Now some may be asking, what in the world does that mean? And what does it have to do with hope? I hear what you're saying, but how does it fully connect with hope? What Paul is telling us is that Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to be hard-pressed, 2 Corinthians 4, on every side, but not crushed, right? Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul is telling us that it is Holy Spirit who brings assurance and strength to our spirit amid our groanings, so that, 2 Corinthians 4, continuing with that, we do not lose heart in our groaning and lose heart in our suffering. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our suffering, our groaning cannot begin to compare with the glory and the consummation of our hope when Christ returns. It can't. He that has called us is faithful. Amen? He that has called us is faithful to complete the work that He's begun in us by faith. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And He has given us help. He has given us help. Not just in some ideal, not just in some philosophy. Come on. Now, we don't just repeat these words and repeat these words and work ourselves up into a frenzy. No, He Himself has come in the person of Holy Spirit that assures us that we are His children. And then even in the midst of our suffering and groaning, God is faithful. And He will, through our suffering and groaning, as we give it to Him, He will continue to conform us into the image of His Son so that we may receive the consummation of our hope. Paul is telling us that it is the assurance of Holy Spirit within our spirit who reminds us that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Also raise us with Jesus. In other words, co-heirs. If we are children of God today, we are co-heirs with Christ. And what Paul is telling us plainly through the Word is that co-heirs receive the same resurrection. The resurrection that we read of in the gospel accounts is the same resurrection that we will experience when Christ returns. The co-heirs receive the same resurrection as the heirs. The redemption of our bodies. Paul is bringing the truth home to us by telling us Holy Spirit is our messenger of hope. Holy Spirit. God Himself is our messenger of hope. His very presence brings hope to our lives. 
But it does not mean that because we have hope, we don't have groaning and we don't have struggle. That's not what we've been reading, is it? We have hope in the midst of our groaning and our struggle. Not because of who we are. And maybe you say like me, well, I just don't have the strength. You're exactly right. I'm just not good enough, smart enough, strong enough. I agree 100% with you. Because I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough. Never was, never will be. You never were, nor will you ever be. That's why God has given us His Spirit as a pledge, as the first fruit. He is a Spirit of hope. Spirit of hope. His very presence brings hopes to our lives. When we talk about that word hope, The biblical concept of hope isn't just wrapped up in expectation and desire. That's what the word means. It carries that meaning of expectation that will come to pass, of something that is sure. But the biblical concept of hope isn't just wrapped up in expectation and desire. It includes trust, confidence, refuge in the God of hope. Romans 15 verse 13. May the God of hope, may the God of hope, come on, tell yourself, you don't have to verbally say it, but say that to yourself, the God of hope. He is the God of hope. That means God is the originator of hope. Hope flows out of the essence of who God is. Hope finds its characteristic in the characteristic of God. May the God of hope, I love this, feel. Feel. You know, when you go get something to eat or you go buy something, you don't like it to be a quarter full, right? Half full. I mean, when you go get something to eat and maybe you've had a down day and and they pile on the fries, or they pile on this. If you ever been there, you go to a, uh, just a buffet, and buddy, you leave, and your plate is just mound up. Well, we all like to eat, right? You leave that line happy, don't you? You leave that line happy. Why? Because that, fl- that plate is full, and I'm about to experience the fullness of my plate. <laughs> we might moan and groan after the fullness of our plate, but we experience the fullness of our plate. But in that, what Paul is telling us, God fills us with hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. It is always attached to that word. Believing, faith. It believe, it's, it's about trusting and having confidence in God and, and living according to His way that I'm not in the driver's seat, God's in the driver's seat, and every day in my groaning, every day in my suffering, I, I'm putting my trust and my confidence in Him and living by the power of Holy Spirit. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so what will transpire in our lives? So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. How do we abound in hope? Well, how do we abound as God's children? How do we abound in our hope? By our strength? By our wisdom? By our understanding? By our emotional being? That's not what Paul says. Paul says we abound, we are full of hope by who? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So Paul is telling us there is a cause and effect in our relationship with God through Christ. God does the feeling with joy and hope. Our responsibility is to do what? Believe. Don't stop believing. Now don't let your mind go to a certain song, but if you go to there, just make sure the believing's in Christ and not in journey. But it's true. Don't stop believing. That's what the Lord spoke this morning. Don't stop believing. In Him and who He is. And that when we walk in obedient faith and we walk in the power of Holy Spirit, that our lives will abound with His presence. Our responsibility is to believe. Paul desires that the process of believing and receiving 
believing and receiving, and I'm not talking about name it, claim it, that we make it happen. We don't make it happen. God makes it happen. We believe it to happen. That's not us making it happen. God makes it happen. We are open and availing our lives in obedience to God making it happen. And as we do that, what does it result in? Paul says the overflowing of hope. Paul here is looking for a full measure of hope in his readers. Not a tentative step in that direction, but a full measure of it. That through the presence of Holy Spirit, we not only live in hope, we abound in hope. The Christian life is just that, God's empowering presence in the midst of life's uncertainty. The Christian walk is simply that, God's abiding presence, his empowering presence in the midst of life's uncertainties. It is not up to us to conjure up hope or any other spiritual quality. Our only access to empowerment is to believe. 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 Believing is what enables us to see. John 20, right? Believing God. And believing is not just some mental mental exercise. It's, Lord, although all of this is telling me one thing, I'm going to be obedient to your word. That's, being, that's believing. I'm going to walk according to what your word says. I'm going to be obedient to you. That's believing. That's opening and availing our lives to the Lord. That's not taking a tentative step toward hope. That's taking a full measure step toward hope. The Christian life is a spiritual life in the fullest sense of the term. Abound means that we exceed in hope to the point that we have hope left over. Just as certainly as we are people of the word, we are also people of hope. And God desires that our lives overflow with hope. And that means that we don't just have enough for ourselves. What does that mean? It means we have the means to give out what God has abundantly filled our lives with. We become reservoirs. Our lives spill over with hope. Does that mean we don't have suffering and we're not groaning? No. Because Paul says that in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our groaning, is the context of hope. Hope. It's a powerful word. But hope is not wishing. Hope is not wishing. Wish it is a desire for something to happen even though there really isn't much expectation of something actually occurring. This is not Paul's meaning to live in hope, to abound in hope. Hope is to have eager expectation for something that is assured. So in other words, whatever I have hope in, I am confident it will take place. Let's backtrack real quickly as I close. Notice how this confident expectation, hope, shows up in the verses in Romans 8. Look back up at verse 19. For the creation waits eagerly, longing. Verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 25. But we hope for what we do not see, <coughs> so we wait for it. We wait for it in patience. We wait for it in hope. We are to wait in hope. Hope, by definition, includes a not yet component. It's future. Our salvation involves hope that our mortal bodies will someday be delivered and liberated from decay. We're not saved by hope, but our salvation is characterized by hope. And since salvation viewed in its completeness rests in the future, we wait for it in hope and assurance that it will come to 
past. First Thessalonians 5, 8, but since we are of the day, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, hope secures our mind. Secures our mind. Our hope is in our salvation. Here and now, but in what is to be fully brought to us at the coming of Christ. As the musicians come back this morning. In Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 26. And notice, Lamentations is about mourning. That's what that word means, mourning. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Right? The weeping, that's what Lamentations is. It's the prophet weeping because of the judgment of God upon the disobedience of man. But in Lamentations 3, 21 through 26, Jeremiah has been, been worn down by the difficulties and disappointments that he's faced. But he discovered a secret <coughs> of personal victory in verse 21. In verse 21, he says, This I recall to mind. To mind, put on the hope of salvation, the helmet of salvation. This I recall to my mind, therefore I hope. Sometimes by an act of our will, that's believing, that's faith, we need to call some things to mind. I'm not talking about naming it and claiming it, taking God's word out of context. I'm talking being in the context of God's word and being obedient to its context in that we call to remembrance who God is. And that's what Jeremiah does. Through an act of his will, he calls things to mind. And Jeremiah's hope sprang forth as he meditated on these things. Lamentations 3, 21. To the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Where is our hope? Where is our hope? Where is our hope? I know we've got an election coming up in November, but where is my hope? Is my hope in one of the candidates? Or is my hope in God? I'm not saying that we should not vote according to the word. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray and shouldn't seek and vote our conscience. We should. We absolutely should. But the individual that, that we voted for doesn't get in, does that mean all hope is lost? For the people who are in the world, yes. But for us as Christians, no. Where's our hope? Because God always keeps his promises. We have a guaranteed future. Therefore, we can endure trials with joy and peace. Our believing will keep us moving when we might otherwise become discouraged and quit. Our experience of hope is always connected with the Holy Spirit and never a personal achievement of our own. Where's our hope? Where's your hope this morning? As you're groaning, as you're suffering, I do not want to make light of your groaning this morning. Can we stand together? Please understand, I am not mocking your suffering. I'm not mocking your groaning. I'm just echoing what the Lord has already spoken through the tongue and interpretation and what He has spoken through His Word. Where is our hope? Where is our hope? Do we need to call to remembrance?